these are the notes for section 4.9. And um, in 4.8, we, uh, we had the contextual situation of having a frozen yogurt stand, so we're going to continue that into today. And um, we were talking about inverses, and we're going to also continue that into today. And so when we know that when we have inverses, it's swapping the x's and the y's, right? So if we have a function, if we have a function <clears throat> that maps an x to a y, then that inverse, remember the inverse notation? with a little minus one in the superscript, switches that. The y becomes its x, and it maps onto the original x of the function. So um, what we're going to look at, though, is we're going to look at this more from a graphical standpoint. So if you notice, we're talking about, like I said, the frozen yogurt stand again. Here is that cost. It would cost you to go listen to the jazz band and purchase some yogurt um, when they were playing there. And so let's just kind of, since we're graphing here, let's just kind of um, talk about, just go back, quick uh, graphing review, right? This is linear. It looks like, um, it looks like y equals mx plus b, but it's actually written as b plus mx um, in, uh, as it's written above. Um, so the input of the function is the, uh, the x, or the z. So the input is z. And remember, the variable z stands for the ounces of yogurt. And the output is the f of z. Um, I think we called that we called that yesterday. We called that D, right? And that is the dollars or the uh, the cost. And so we're going to graph that. So um, we have uh, five plus point four Z. So it looks like if we um, maybe we just count by ones here. So this is five and ten and 15 and 20 and 25 dollars. So this is the cost in dollars. And uh, also 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and this is the ounces um, the ounces of yogurt, so Z. So um, we uh, have an intercept of five. So uh, we've got an intercept of five. And then this is the tricky part, right? We go up by 0.4 and over one, but up by 0.4 doesn't make sense um, with this graph, with the resolution. Like I can't count by 0.4s. Um, but I do know that if I go, if I multiply by 10, right, then I've gone up, um, I multiply the 0.4 by 10, I've gone up $4. So at 10, I'm at $9. Remember that from yesterday? 10 ounces of yogurt was nine would cost us $9. Um, and then um, 20 ounces of yogurt would then cost us another $4. So that would be 13 which is right there. So that is the linear relationship uh, for, the, uh, for the cost it's going to be uh, to, um, to go see uh, the jazz band. OK, so um, part C here says, sweet yours restricts the number of ounces you can get to 24 ounces. What's the minimum amount of money you would need to bring to attend the event and what's the maximum amount of money? Okay, so um, they they don't want you to buy too much yogurt, right? They're going to restrict it to 24 ounces so that they don't run out, you know, maybe. Um, so let's talk about minimums. So when looking at this graphically, right, the minimum would be the lowest point on that graph. So the minimum 
would be basically if you'd go in, you buy no yogurt, right? You just pay to, to listen to the jazz band. So the minimum would be a Z equals zero. And so our F of Z is going to be 5 plus 0.4 times 0, which is 5. So that's our minimum. And our maximum then is if we go in and we buy 24 ounces of yogurt. And um, so I think I'm spelling yogurt wrong. It's U-R-T, not A-R-T. Anyway. Um, so that would be Z equals 24, and so F of Z is now 5 plus 0 0.4 times 24, and that is uh, $14.60. So um, our maximum is 24 ounces, which is right here, that's 24 ounces and it's going to be $14.60, which must be that point right there. So this is 24 and 14.60. So that's the maximum. So really anything beyond that, you might say uh, this stuff uh, is, is uh, not part of the the uh, function we're concerned about, so we can just kind of eliminate that. Actually, thinking that through, maybe I, I'll change colors there. We can kind of eliminate this. Okay, so that is, uh, so this, this uh, graph has a definite beginning and a definite end, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Um, and then, you know, as long as I'm putting it on the graph, here is the minimum 0, 0,5. Okay, so the graph then, since it has a beginning and an end, uh, it has a domain and a range. We can, we can look at it that way. So um, when we talk about domain and range, um, the domain then is, are those x values. So the domain are these x values. So it looks like here that the domain is going to be those x values um, from 0 to 24, however you want to rate that. Um, we can use a, you know, a couple different notations. You can just say 0 to 24 ounces. You can just say it verbally too. And then the range, the range is the value is the is the corresponding y values. So the range is going to be uh, well. Let's see. We start at five and we go up to uh, that fourteen point six, right? So um, from five to fourteen dollars and sixty cents is going to be uh, a range that's dollars. <clears throat> okay, and so um, so that's that's our uh, relationship uh, as we kind of stated it using that function that uh, relates uh, the amount of frozen yogurt to the cost that uh, you're going to incur for the evening. Um, so looking at it now from the inverse's perspective, right? So, so this was, uh, in, in part one, we looked at it from the original function standpoint. No, now, if you notice, we have the inverses uh, expression here. And so this is also linear. Um, <clears throat> so we know that this is, since this is the inverse, everything is flipped, right? Um, our input now, um, notice the questions are kind of the same, right? A is what is the input? Our input is now the dollars. So um, I'm actually going to literally take this and duplicate it and bring it down here so that word for word it's the same. Our, our input is now the cost in dollars. 
and our output, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to duplicate this and bring this down. Our output is now how much yogurt can I buy, right? That's the, uh, that's the inverse relationship, which means then that if those flip, then the domain and the range flips, right? Because we're talking about literally flipping our X's and our Y's. So now, <clears throat> if, we, uh, if we talk about the domain, I don't think I'm gonna do a duplicate here. I think I'm gonna do a, uh, just a rewrite here. So now the, the domain, I'm gonna also flip my colors. Uh, now the domain is the cost, the money. So I'll come up here and duplicate this expression. The domain is the cost now. That becomes our input. There we go. And the range now becomes our output, becomes our uh, ounces of yogurt, that's our output. So I'm gonna go up and duplicate that that becomes our range. And so those have flipped. <clears throat> so we literally have that flipping of what was our domain is now our range. Let me break those arrows a little bit better. And, <clears throat> <coughs> excuse me, what was our range is now our domain. And so how do we graph that? Well, the easiest way to graph that, because you know this this is also linear. Um, this is also y equals mx plus b. Um, it's a it's hard to see in that form, but we really have f inverse of d is d over zero point four minus 5 over 0 0.4, okay? So your B, you can see your B, um, I'm trying to decide what color to use here. Your B is this, whatever that number is, and your M is this with a 1 right there, 1 over 0 0.4. But like I said, um, that is really hard to see and really hard to graph. There's an easier way to graph the inverse. This is the kind of cool thing. If I want to graph this inverse, I'm just going to swap my x's and my y's. So this is the kind of cool thing. So in other words, um, I know I have these two points. Remember the, uh, the minimum and the maximum points? We're just going to switch those. So um, we're going to switch the x's and y's of those points. So instead of 0, 5, we're going to have 5, 0. Let me get my red here. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> actually, before I do anything, let me get my scale here. I'm going to go back to orange. Right, our scale is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. This is now our cost in dollars, and this is now our output, which is our ounces of yogurt, okay? And so, like I said, the, easy, the easiest way to graph this inverse is, to, is because we've got a couple of points, um, we have a beginning and an end, and we know it's linear, uh, we're, just gonna flip, we're just gonna flip the x's and y's. So instead of zero, five, this becomes five, zero. Right, we're, sw we're flipping the x's and the y's. So five zero is right here. And <clears throat> instead of 24 and $14.60, we're gonna swap those. So it's gonna be $14.60 and 24. Um, so $14.60 and 24 would be, 20, we know 24 is right there, so it'd be right there. So that's $14, whoops, and 60 cents comma 24. And we know that then 
since we've swapped the x's and the y's, that that is our inverse function. Okay, so this is the interesting thing about the inverse function, and that is these lines have a relationship, and it's hard to see when it's on two separate graphs. But because we switched from an, a y-intercept to an x-intercept, and because we switched these coordinates from uh, x to y and switched it to y and x, these are actually reflections over the line y equals x. So these two graphs, I'm trying to think of what color I want, I think I'll go purple here. Let's go a lighter purple. These two graphs are reflections over oops, the line y equals x, right? And, and this, this line y equals x, notice this is the inverse of itself, right? If we swap the x and the y, we get x equals y, which is the same thing. So there's the inverse. So that line is the inverse of itself. So if we draw that line on each graph, y equals x is just going to be every x value matches every y value. Um, and then I'm going to change that style to a dashed line. Uh, something, uh, maybe a dotted line. That'll work. If we graph that line y equals x, what we see, and we graph it down here. Whoops. Got a little carried away there. There we go. There's the line y equals x. That's that same line. Let me get the coloring or the uh, formatting there. Y equals x. We can see, um, it, like I said, it's kind of tough to see with it graphed on uh, separate graphs. I'm going to actually superimpose the original um, line down on the, this original line. I'm going to I'm going to put it. I'm going to graph it down here so you can see that reflection a little bit better. But <clears throat> it's a reflection over that line. So let's do that. Let's take this line and duplicate it and slide it down. There we go, to here. Right, it should be right there. Um, let me zoom in a little bit and get that exact. Right, it should be right there. So if you notice, and then let me, um, actually let me make that a dashed line because that was from the graph above. So this is, I'm just gonna put a little note here. Um, from above. Okay, so from question, from question, from number one above, there we go. Um, so notice that reflective, that reflection. Um, notice that um, they cross where the y's and the x's are the same, right? So when we swap them, we get the same point. So notice that if we look at this point here, it maps to this point here. Notice that reflection. This point here maps to this point there. So it's a reflection over that line y equals x, which is kind of cool. Um, and it, it has a lot of visual benefits. Um, now we can just, by graphically, uh, we can just notice that, um, that reflective quality, which is kind of cool. So, um, so looking at question four, it says, if Ross spends $9.40 for the event, how much yogurt did he get? Is there any amount of yogurt he could have purchased that would cost him $9.40 total. So um, if you remember $9.40 from the previous class was 11 ounces of yogurt. 
So this, this statement is actually getting at the idea of, of the inverse. This first statement, I'm running out of colors here, uh, we'll go dark green. This first statement is $9.40 was our 11 ounces of yogurt. And this second statement, is there any amount of yogurt he could have bought that would cost him $9.40 is saying 11 ounces nine dollars and forty cents so it's it's really getting at um actually i think i swapped the colors there let me uh let me make this blue and this green there we go uh if ross spends uh nine nope i didn't have that right to begin with if Ross spends $9.40 for the event, how much yogurt could he get? That's the input and the output. So input is $9.40, output is the number of ounces, and then is there any amount of yogurt he could have purchased um, that would cost him $9.40 total um, would be just reversing that and taking that inverse. Um, and so we can see that um, on the graph as well, uh, that those are inverses of one another. 11 ounces of yogurt coming back up to here. What color was that? Uh, <clears throat> used blue. So 11 ounces of yogurt comes up to $9.40. And then down here, $9.40, that was the dark green, $9.40 would get us 11 ounces of yogurt. So that's that. And so that other point, if I brought that other point down from the other graph, it would be right there. There's that reflection over the line y equals x. Um, so <clears throat> what we're looking at then in terms of learning targets is that <clears throat> um, we, we're really looking at that graphical quality. So um, the, there's two learning targets. We could kind of combine them here. It's actually three learning targets total. But the first two we're gonna kinda combine, um, and that is that uh, F and the inverse of F are reflections over the line Y equals X. <clears throat> and, um, and that means the domain and the range flip-flop, right? The X's and the Y's flip-flop. <clears throat> they, uh, so the domain, domain of F becomes the range of F inverse. And vice versa, the range <clears throat> of F becomes the domain of the inverse. Okay, inputs and outputs switch uh, is basically what we're saying here. Um, and then the other thing is, is kind of an extension of this, and it's really, um, I haven't really discussed it up here in the notes, but if we look at the original function and its inverse, inverse is also a function, right? We talked about passing the vertical line test um, graphically when we talk about what is a function and what is not a function. And so um, when, when that happens, we call that one-to-one. -one. So um, we, we talk about this one-to-one -one phenomenon. So 
if f <coughs> is a function, uh, let me let me re let me rewrite that. F and the inverse are both functions. Okay. Um, so, and that that that's the idea of one to one. If f and its inverse are both functions, um, then we say that the function is one to one. And so what that means is that for every x, there is only one y. I think maybe I should write the word one, not use a number, one y. Um, every x maps into exactly one y and vice versa. And um, we're gonna kind of, I'm gonna kind of do a check your understanding because this this gets at the one to one, um, this one to one phenomenon. And since we since we haven't really talked about it too much, I want to do the check your understanding just to go through this um, this idea. So we're gonna sketch this. Um, I'll go back to orange, I think. And so we know from the uh, from our previous unit that this is a parabola, right? Um, and its vertex is one three. And so we know we have a vertex here. It's one three, and um, it it grows like a normal parabola. So let's just graph this over one, up three, and then we go over one, up one on both sides. And over one up one two three over one up one two three and over one up one two three four five one two three four five roughly about there and so we get our parabolic function that looks kind of like this there we go okay and um, And so if we notice, there's the sketch of, of f, of x, or h of x, excuse me. So the domain here, domain, uh, we can use all real numbers, right? And our range, I'm going to write that out, range, is also all real numbers. And also write domain out. I think that that abbreviation probably is might be a little confusing because range starts with R as well. So I think I'm going to write domain. There we go. And um, right, we can use the domain is all reals, right? We we use this entire number line as this grows, and our range is not all reals. Wow, that's that's. Uh, not true because our range starts here whoops our range starts here at three and we use everything above three so our range is really all values <clears throat> greater than or equal to three so h of x has got to be greater than or equal to three that's our range and so um uh, it says write an expression of the inverse of h so the inverse is swapping the x and y's, and uh, we, we uh, practiced this yesterday, right? Uh, the previous class, swapping the x's and the y's. So let's start out by calling this y equals x minus one squared plus three, and then we're gonna um, swap the x's and the y's, so x equals y minus one. Getting a little sloppy here. y minus one squared plus three, and then we're gonna solve for y. So we're going to subtract 3 from both sides. We get x minus 3 equals y minus 1 quantity squared. And then we're going to square root both sides. So we get the square root of x minus 3 equals y minus 1. And then we're going to add 1 to both sides. So we get y equals the square root of x minus 3 on the inside plus 1 on the outside. And that's in, it's kind of important to to realize that the x minus three is on the inside. I'm trying to ex, 
make that square root a little bit longer. So it's really important to recognize that the x minus 3 is on the inside and the plus 1 is on the outside. We have to make that really obvious when we write that so that it's not misinterpreted when it's graded. Um, and that also tells us about what's happening to that vertex. So the idea then is if I would graph this, it wouldn't be this entire parabola. It would be over 3 up 1, and it would just be the top part of the parabola. And so if I don't start restricting the domain, then if I want to um, just graphically draw this inverse, then I could just literally switch the domain in the range, right? So for the inverse, I could say that the domain is all x values greater than or equal to 3, right? That's, that's, the, uh, that's what this is saying, right? Because this y becomes the x now we're swapping. And the range becomes all real numbers. And so if that's the case, then if I just draw my inverse, one, this is 1, 3, so my inverse would be 3, 1, right? That's where that point would map to, is 3, 1. And instead of going over and up 1, I'm going to go up and over 1, right? I'm going to swap those, and down and over 1. And instead of over 1, up 3, I'm going to go up 1, over 3, right, swapping, up 1, over 1, 2, 3, down 1, over 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to start to get the parabola that looks like this, okay, and that is, what I use purple, right, here's line y equals x, Right, here's that here's that line of reflection. Oof, my handwriting is getting so sloppy. Let's try that again. Y equals x. There we go. So notice that's that um, that's the inverse, but we don't typically um, we calculate or we found the inverse here, right? We found this inverse here. Um, but if we would graph this, you know, we graphed this in the previous unit, right? If we would graph that, it would only be this. Um, but the strict, strict, strictly speaking, the inverse of this parabola is this pink parabola. And um, you got to ask yourself, is the, if this is the inverse, right, this is... Um, this is h of x, so this is the inverse h minus 1 of x. Is this inverse a function? So is h minus 1 s a function? That's what it's asking. And the answer to that is no. If we look at that, um, and we try to apply the vertical line test, it doesn't work, right? If we try to apply the vertical line test, here's the vertical line test, it doesn't work. Okay, so um, H inverse doesn't pass vertical line test. That's one way of, of, of justifying it, but there's another way to justify it without even graphing the inverse, okay? I should be able to look at this and say whether or not it's one-to-one, -one, 
Okay, that's that 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 means you know this is the another way of saying is it one to one? Is the inverse of h a function? Let me highlight that inverse of h a function. That is another way of saying is it one to one? That's what that question is asking, and the answer is no. It's not one to one because when we look at the inverse, this itself the pink is not a function. But there's another way to look at that without even having to draw this. We can look at this and say, well, if this is the inverse and we're looking at the vertical line test, and we know the inverse is swapping the x's and the y's, then this vertical line test becomes a horizontal line test on the original function, right? Swapping x's and y's. Vertical becomes horizontal. And so we can simply bypass the whole idea of drawing its inverse by just looking at the original function and saying as our justification, no, because, whoops, let me get the right color there. No, because um, the original function, h of x, doesn't pass the horizontal line test. I'm actually going to change this color to red because I'll draw a horizontal line. So coming up here, if we drew a, a random horizontal line, ah, not getting the color coding right. There we go. We draw a random horizontal line. That's not even horizontal. Let's try that again. There we go. Uh, we can see that it touches in two points, so this horizontal line test. Uh, it doesn't pass. That original function does pass the vertical line test. So the original h of x is a function, but this horizontal line test is saying the inverse is not a function. Okay, so that so that, and that that way we don't have to look at the graph the inverse at all. So let's kind of try that with number two. Here's a, a velocity function, okay? And itself, that velocity function itself is a function, right? It's, it, it, it passes the vertical line test. Um, but let's talk about its inverse in, in, in the context of talking about its inverse without drawing the inverse. So we have this velocity of an ant, um, and um, the velocity is measured in inches per minute. It's given by the graph of VFT, shown below, for the first four seconds. So again, uh, we're going to look at a definite beginning and a definite end, even though it's drawn beyond those two locations. So we are literally looking at just this portion of that velocity function. So identify the x-intercepts and interpret these values in the context of the problem. So x-intercepts, right? That is right here. Uh, that's at 0, 0. And here at 3, 0. And so um, the context of the problem says basically attach the, uh, the units onto this. So at zero minutes, uh, v of t equals zero. And at three minutes, oh, my handwriting is just terrible. Minutes, there we go. v of t is also zero. Okay, so at the beginning, the ant is not moving. And at three seconds, the ant is also momentarily at rest, not moving. Okay, so let's think about the graph of the inverse. How would you label the horizontal and vertical axes? Well, they would switch, right? The horizontal axis, the horizontal axis would now be our inches per minute. And our vertical axis would now be our minutes, right? Those would swap. And um, 
So the we have that input slash output swap going on there. And uh, C, C says identify the y-intercepts of the inverse. So think about that. Y-intercepts of the inverse, those are the x-intercepts of v of t, the original function. Right? The inverse is v minus 1 of t. That would be the inverse. I'm going to write that in green. There we go. Okay, so the y-intercepts of the inverse are the x-intercepts of the original function. So the y-intercepts of the inverse become what is written in part A, um, but swapped. So swapping 0, 0 is still 0, 0. Swapping 3, 0 is 0, 3. All right, and so, but notice it's, it's really saying the same thing, right? At, zero, now this is swapped, so this is at zero, um, we're moving zero inches per minute at zero minutes, right, that's, that's what the inverse is of swapping the x's and the y, and this one's saying we're moving zero inches per minute at three minutes. Um, it says, for which values of t is v of t equal to 8? So, um, looking at this, v of t is equal to 8 is right here. So, uh, v of t is equal to 8. When are we going 8 inches per minute? And we're doing that when t equals 1 and when t equals 4. And if you look at this, basically when I drew this line here um, at 8, this could turn into our horizontal line test. Okay. And so if you notice, even if we move that line, let me take this line and, and relocate it, right? If we move that line and apply that horizontal line test anywhere, we can see that it crosses the function more than once. So we know that um, this is not one-to-one. -one. So we know that V of T is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, v of T is not one to one um, because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test and so we don't even need to find the inverse um, to know that this function is not one to one it is a function though right it passes the vertical line test itself but its, its inverse wouldn't be a function. It would be something like above, where, where um, the inverse would be crisscrossing back and forth on, onto itself. So it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, so that was not a one-to-one -one function either. Um, so as you go into your homework, um, that's what you're going to be doing, is you're going to be given a function, and you, you're going to have to find the inverse based on those reflection, um, that reflection criteria, and I think that's a puzzle. Uh, that you solve, so it's kind of self-correcting.